Hello, I'm Wendy and that's Beth. Hello. And we would like to take a moment to welcome new listeners. So welcome, Buiti Binafi and Bienvenidos Bitches to Fruit Loops Serial Killers of Color. Fruit Loops Serial Killers of Color is a weekly podcast hosted by us, mm-hmm. a multiracial, multigenerational set of BFFs. How did we get here? Well, when we realized that podcasts like ours about marginalized perpetrators and victims with hosts like us didn't exist, we just decided to do it ourselves. Yes, so join us as we tell the fascinating stories of the crimes and the victims that often go untold by the mainstream media. And because context is everything, we often add in historical and cultural details of the crimes and criminals in order to get a sense of what might have led to these crimes. We love talking about true crime, but we also use these true crime stories as an opportunity to talk about race relations, systemic racism, policing, history, and culture. We learn something new every day, and we hope that you do too. We are really excited to share that Apple Podcasts has featured us as a creator we love throughout the year. Apple Podcast celebrates well-established podcasters leading their categories, and we were selected for true crime. Hey, Bobby, your horns. <laughs> <laughs> so dive into our feed and share an episode with a friend. You can expect to hear a new episode every Thursday. Oh, and uh, be forewarned, we do sometimes use explicit language, and some of the content we discuss may be disturbing to some listeners. But we also have a lot of fun, so join us. Life is like a hurricane here at Crime Con. <laughs> Mysteries, murders, evidence. It's a Crime Con. <laughs> crime Con. Woo! The danger lurks behind you. That's right, Fruities. Crime Con <laughs> 2023 is going to be in Orlando, Florida. We outside. Yeah, yeah. We're pretty excited to be able to attend again and meet up with some folks that we met last year. Plus, meet some new true crime buddies. Hopefully you. Yeah. So we'll be on Podcast Row with many other great podcasts like Affirmative Murder, Jerry Williams from FBI Retired, The Prosecutors, Minds of Madness, just to name a few. Plus, there's going to be tons of sessions, big personalities and entertainment with plenty of opportunities to meet other like-minded folks across the true crime universe. Please join us from September 22nd to the 24th at CrimeCon 2023 in Orlando for an immersive week-long event dedicated to all things true crime and mystery. Tickets are on sale right now, just go to CrimeCon.com and be sure to use the code Fruit Loops. that's F-R-U-I-T-L-O-O-P-S to save 10% and let them know we sent you. That's CrimeCon.com and use the code Fruit Loops. We're so excited to meet you. Sing it with me here at <laughs> CrimeCon. <laughs> This podcast contains adult themes and language, and some of the things that we discuss may be disturbing to some listeners. In this podcast, we discuss sexual assault, torture, race, and murder. Listener discretion is advised. Please take care of yourself. Everyone and welcome to Fruit Loops, episode two hundred and two. Bienvenidos, bitches, and buiti binafi. Yes, thank you for listening. Thank yeah. you for being here. Fruit Loops is a podcast about true crimes committed by people of color and those who are othered and the victims, because contrary to popular belief, not all serial killers are straight cisgendered white dudes. What? And these crimes rarely get any public attention because. The news is racist, allegedly. <laughs> You're just going back and forth with different accents. You know, yeah, I'm just, yeah. You know yeah. what? Pretend Fuck like it. I'm not here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and we are Wendy and Beth. She's Wendy, a black Latinx woman. And I'm Beth, and I just happen to be white. She's one of the good ones, y'all. <laughs> Fix her plate, even though it's too hot for any cookouts yeah. in Phoenix. We'll do an indoor yeah. cookout. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> We're not journalists, investigators, or psychologists. Just a couple of gals interested in true crime. Also, the opinions expressed in this podcast are just that, our opinions. That's right. So who are we talking about today, Beth? 
Well, today we're talking about Fatoshi Matsunaga and Junko Agata, a Japanese serial killer couple who killed at least seven people between 1996 and 1998. Most of the victims were from Junko's own family, and their crimes were so brutal that most Japanese media outlets stopped reporting the details. And uh, we should actually give an extra trigger warning on this one because it's pretty horrific. Yeah. There's torture, extreme domestic violence, and suicide. Mm-hmm. So there you go. Yes. And we'll say this later on, but if you or someone you know is struggling with thoughts of self-harm, don't forget that you can text 988 Suicide and Crisis Lifeline yeah. 24-7. It's free. Or um, we'll give some more resources later on as well. But if you or somebody you know is dealing with domestic violence, check out the National Domestic Violence Hotline for support and resources. So before we get into this episode, how you doing, friend? I'm good. Yeah, nothing much to report this week. No new birds. Or no, no. Didn't save any birds or... this week. So Okay, okay. <laughs> well, I guess I'll have to take this cape off of your back. <laughs> How you doing? I'm good. Good, good. I had family in town. Ooh. School is starting up. We did school shopping. Our kids were uniforms, so we had to go to a bunch of uniform stores. And it's just ramping up for school yeah. to start. It's yeah. a busy time. But right. all is well. Power went out earlier today because we got some storms. But uh, we're back. Internet's back. Power's yeah. back. Here we are. <laughs> Without further ado, let's get into some listener letters. All right. Thank you, angels. <sighs> yes. What's in that bag, Beth? Well, I wanted to say thank you to Cat, Cruise Ship, and Marlene for giving us five-star reviews on Apple Podcasts. Yes, thank you all. And we could use some more, mm-hmm. so. <laughs> yeah, keep them coming. Five stars only, coming. please. <laughs> if you have a comment, you know where to find us. Yeah. But uh, yeah, you don't have to leave a negative review. You don't we have to. We are open to <laughs> suggestions and criticism. We just want to make a good show. So if you have thoughts. Yeah, email us. Get at us. Yeah. yeah. All those people who left negative reviews, I'm like, let just us know. Email us. Just reach out to us. Yeah. We will look into it. Yeah. Happy to. But uh, what else we got in that bag? We got a voicemail from Jesse in San Diego. Jesse, I love your voicemail. Yeah. Thank you. And I'm going to play it right now. Okay. Ready? I'm ready. Okay. Hi, Wendy and Beth. Oh, my God. <laughs> so uh, um, where do I start? Uh, just uh, bienvenido. Uh, bien titinaki. I don't know. But I just want to say I'm super proud of, of uh-huh. what you two ladies are doing. And oh. shout out for, I think, being one of the only one of the only men listening, you know, love, but we love, I we love, love you. Right? being able to see myself in the stories of serial killers. No, uh, <laughs> victims, right. Who are people of color. So Amen. Uh, thank you for doing your hard work, your long work, the work from different states, different rooms. Thank you for being mm-hmm. genuine and being yourself. Uh-huh. And thank you for responding to the people that listen to you and love to listen to you feel like we're just all hanging out together and uh-huh. you yes know, and hey hit the dj air horn yes uh, <laughs> uh, like so much. Being you and san diego is waiting for a live show uh-huh. please, please, please please okay bye oh jesse thank, thank you. you so much so much. Air horns to jesse yeah it was a beautiful voicemail. Yeah, it meant so much it. to us when we got it. And we're grateful that you called and we can share it with, with the listeners. We yeah. love it when you guys call us and let us know what's going on. We can't do this show without you. We won't do this show without <laughs> you. So it, it keeps us going. And it Jesse really and does. Jesse, yeah. Jesse, your voicemail came at like the perfect time. Yeah. And we just love you so much. Besos. <laughs> and we'll see you sometime in yeah. the future, San Diego. <laughs> And please send any questions or comments to fruitloopspod at gmail.com or leave us a voicemail at 602-935-6294. And we may feature it on a future episode, just like we did Jesse's. Yeah. Also, if you don't want us to play the voicemail, tell us in the voicemail. Be like, you know, yeah. here's my voicemail. Please don't put it in an episode. Yeah. <laughs> and we promise we won't. We won't. <laughs> Yeah. Also, join us on Patreon, where we have literally hundreds of hours of bonus content, 
And we have a video club for 12 plus patrons where you can interact with us in person. That's right. This month we are watching The Stroll. Yeah. A documentary about BIPOC sex workers in New York. Yeah. Well, we have a new Patreon this week. I want to say thank you to Raven G. But we love you. We love you supporting our show. We hope you enjoy the bonus content over there. And we also hope you enjoy this thank you tune. Real quick, your hip hop air horns, here they are because I'm a forgetful bitch. <laughs> <laughs> All right. 200 episodes and one in the hole. Fruit Loops is about to make some bodies turn cold. Now they're <laughs> potting and yelling. It's a tad bit late. Fruit Loops and Raven G had to regulate. <laughs> So thank you. <laughs> yeah, thanks, <laughs> Raven. <laughs> I hope you like my Nate Dog cover. All right, y'all, that's it for now. We're going to take a quick break, and then we're going to get into the story when we come back. the end of summer blues with HelloFresh. That's right. No need to stress about how you'll handle it all this fall because HelloFresh takes care of the meal planning and delivers pre-portioned ingredients right to your home. So whipping up a homemade meal is a cinch. This fall, you've got places to be, like CrimeCon. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and standing in the checkout line is not one of them. Leave the meal planning and grocery shopping to HelloFresh. You'll save so much time and cut out the hassle. Now, I personally love HelloFresh because yeah. it saves me so much time. I feel so much joy when it's delivered to my yeah. house. <laughs> so picture the Williams household, a weeknight. It's about 5 p.m. and it's a madhouse. There's work, there's homework, there's after school activities, and oh crap, people need to eat oh, dinner. Geez, every night. Every day? <laughs> Why they gotta eat every day? <laughs> <laughs> bada bing, bada boom. We just bust open the fridge and grab those pre packaged ingredients, pre measured and everything. And before you can say, Hello Fresh is America's number one meal kit, <laughs> we have an easy, delicious dinner prepared that the whole family loves in about 30 minutes. And just the other night, we cooked, mm, this was so good, a sweet and spicy shrimp and noodle stir mm. fry with bok choy, carrots, cilantro, and sesame. And it was so uh, sounds good. yummy. Yeah. And it was done in like 15 minutes. Wow. Yeah. So when life gets busy, don't call for delivery. Get HelloFresh. It's 25% cheaper than takeout and less expensive than grocery shopping, too. Now, we've used every plate in the past. Yeah. And every plate, good news, is now owned by HelloFresh, which is great. And with a wider array of meal plans to choose from, there's something for everyone. So go to HelloFresh.com slash 50 Fruit Loops Pod and use code 50 Fruit Loops Pod for 50% off plus free shipping. That's HelloFresh.com slash 50 Fruit Loops Pod and use code 50 Fruit Loops Pod for 50% off plus free shipping. Thanks, HelloFresh. Listen to Mr. Bunker's Conspiracy Time podcast. It's a fun show about weird stuff. New episodes every Wednesday, ya eggheads. I'm Art. And I'm Andy. And Mr. Bunker's Conspiracy Time is a podcast about conspiracies, the paranormal, UFOs, unsolved mysteries. We're, we're going to be discussing the Kennedy assassinations. Oh, yeah. That's his nickname, Finger Banging Bob Lazar. Give me some aliens with some good frickin' spacecraft. The whole enchilada. <laughs> the only thing bigger than Bigfoot's feet are our egos. If you like simulation theory, ancient history, egghead science, and Mandela effect, that kind of stuff. So check it out. New episodes every Wednesday. All the links you need on MrBunkersConspiracyTime.com. And we'll see you in the bunker. Okay, we are back. Remind us, Beth, who is our subject today? Our subject today is Fatoshi Matsunaga, along with his accomplice, Junko Ogata, who defrauded and tortured their victims and also forced them to torture each other mm -hmm. in what is known in Japan as the Kitayushu serial murder incident. All right, so we're going to get into some stats I've also heard it referred to as the family murders. Oh, okay. This killing spree was from 1996 to 1998 in Japan. They tortured and killed seven people. Most of the victims were Junko Ogata's family members. And the method of murder varied from electrocution, strangulation, as well as starvation. And I believe there may have also been an unaliving of oneself in there. Yes. So we would like to say love and light to the victims, their names, rest in power, all of you. Kumio Toraya, 34, Takashige Ogata, 61, Shizumi Ogata, 58, 
Reiko Ogata, 33, Kazuya Ogata, 38, Yuki Ogata, 5 years old, and Aya Ogata, 10 years old. So now let's dive into the setting. Take us there, Beth. The setting is Kita Kyushu, Japan. Japan is made up of 14,125 islands, and I had no idea that there were so many. They extend along the Pacific coast of Asia. The country's five main islands from north to south are Hokkaido, Honshu, Shikoku, Kyushu, and Okinawa. Mm. Honshu is the largest and the country's main island, and the cities on Honshu include Tokyo, Kyoto, and Osaka. Kyushu is the third largest island, separated from Honshu by the Kanmon Straits. Nagasaki, one of the cities targeted by a U.S. atomic bomb in World War II, is located in Kyushu. Over two square miles of the city was pulverized, and some 73,000 people were killed as a result of that bombing. Yeah. Being the nearest island to the Asian continent, Kyushu has been historically considered the gateway to Japan. In the northern area of Fukuoka Prefecture, on the northernmost tip of Kyushu, is the city of Kitakyushu. In Japanese, the name Kitakyushu translates literally to North Kyushu. Kitakyushu was formed in 1963 from the merger of five cities. The city is an important port for international trade and is considered one of Kyushu's main industrial hubs. Originally, it was just a small fishing village but then played a leading role in Japan's Meiji Industrial Revolution in the 19th century. The Meiji Restoration was a political transformation, a series of rapid changes that transformed Japan from an isolationist feudal state to an industrialized world power. The Meiji Restoration accelerated Japan's industrialization process, which led to its rise as a military power by 1895. Prior to this, Japan was a feudal, pre-industrial country controlled by a feudal military dictatorship, a shogunate, who ruled over the country's 270 decentralized domains. There was an emperor, but the role of the emperor was largely ceremonial. In the 1850s and 60s, a movement sought to overthrow the shogunate and restore the power of the emperor of Japan. The Meiji leaders were concerned that Japan might become a colony under the control of another nation. Not uh, not surprised they were worried about that. Sure. Yeah, because it had been the fate of much of India and Southeast Asia. You're right. Mm-hmm. So they resolved that their government needed to have a sole political power in order to construct a modern state. It succeeded in 1868 and in 1871... Emperor Meiji and the new Meiji government abolished feudalism, replacing Japan's domains with prefectures. It was a bloodless revolution. Oh, that's unusual. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And a huge transformation. The Meiji Restoration drew from both Western models and Japanese traditions. In 1871, the architects of this change embarked on the Iwakura mission, an 18-month-long, quote, voyage of discovery, unquote, led by Iwakura Tomomi. Seeking blueprints for constructing a modern nation, 100 Japanese leaders, government officials, and students set off on a ship headed to Europe and the United States to observe and learn. The Meiji Restoration allowed Japan to develop into a modern industrial nation-state that rivaled European nations in both military and economic power. The reforms enacted during this time brought about the modernization and westernization of the country and paved the way for Japan to become a major international power. However, (laughs) confidence and a shift to militarism carried the country to defeat in World War II. But after several years of Allied occupation, Japan regained independence and entered a third stage of industrial growth. Since the 1950s, the country has emerged as one of the most economically and technologically advanced societies in the world. The large-scale industrialization of the country in the post-war period led to mass urban migration. As a result, contemporary Japan is heavily urbanized, with approximately 91% of the population living in urban areas. I want to visit there so bad. Yeah. Someday. (laughs) Yeah. So uh, is there a crime con in Japan? Japan. <laughs> I'm not so cool. uh, So th- these developments have occurred alongside the continuation of intricate and longstanding cultural traditions. Saving face is an important cultural value in Japan. 
uh, and that's important to the story. It means to keep your honor, not behave in a dishonorable manner, or cause someone else to lose their face. It's about maintaining respect and avoiding shame and humiliation. The instinct to preserve face is so ingrained in Japanese culture that many Japanese are not even aware that it influences their behavior. And it's somewhat acceptable to lie to protect face. Shame culture, which is also prevalent in other parts of Asia, is maybe the main driving force that prompts this extensive preoccupation with one's face. The concept of saving face is somewhat similar to what we refer to as maintaining a good reputation in Western culture, or I'm trying to think in Caribbean or Latin A culture, el que dirán, what hmm. will they say? What will the neighbors oh, say? Yeah, yeah. But it is also about maintaining other people's reputations. As a more communal society, it motivates people to be careful to maintain the face of others. Personal relationships and social harmony are considered to be the bedrock of Japanese society. So great care is usually taken to protect each other's face. The Japanese tend to try to find an appropriate way to adapt their own wishes to the requirements of others and thus avoid offending or harming other people's public image. I'm going to go out on a limb here, but this reminds me of how women act. Yeah. Yeah. It does prevent like men's ire or anger yeah. in public. So, I mean, I'm just Throwing saying it out that there. If, yeah. if you're wondering like, what, 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 what could that be like? You know, that was my thought. Yeah. Putting yourself in other, somebody yes, else's shoes. Um, actually That's subjugating your own needs above the needs of somebody else. Thank you. That's yeah. why she's the OG of true crime. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now we're going to get into the early life of these individuals. Hit it, Beth. Well, first, I have to say that a lot of the sources that we use were translated from Japanese. Mm -hmm. We use Google Translate. So if you want a puzzle, try and put together a story that's poorly translated from another language. It's hard. (laughs) (laughs) And it's very possible and even probable that we got some information wrong. So please let us know if we did. Please, please. So Fotoshi Matsunaga was born on April 28, 1961 in Kyushu. He was part of a wealthy family and the eldest son. His grandfather owned a tatami shop where his father worked. Tatami is the straw mat that is used as flooring in Japanese homes. Reportedly, he respected his grandfather, but despised his father. I think because he felt like his grandfather had great ideas for the business and everything, and Mm -hmm. his father just worked there. (laughs) Yeah. That's what I always say to get out of doing important jobs. (laughs) I just, I just work, work here. here. <laughs> <laughs> I could see how others might not like that. Anyway, <laughs> Futushi did well in school, but he had a bit of lying or misrepresenting of facts, so was never trusted by his teachers or his classmates. One classmate described him as, quote, not a team player and strange, unquote. Reportedly, at one point, he was diagnosed with disinhibited social engagement disorder, a childhood attachment disorder. This is a disorder where a child is not bonded with his or her caregivers and is just as comfortable with strangers as with family. And I don't know the veracity of this, but it was mentioned. Yeah. And all the sources I referred to. Oh, really? Okay. Every single one of them mentioned this. Okay. So I'm very glad to see it. And I'm wondering, before we move on, uh, do you have any additional thoughts on this disorder, OG of true crime? Yeah, it's... I don't know that much about it. I know that... Okay, I don't want to put you on the spot. No, it's okay. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) It's okay. So kids who have this disorder are like super friendly Mm -hmm. and they'll just go walk up to a stranger and there's no fear. Yeah. They're not... There's no stranger danger. They'll just walk right up to them and start talking. And... Okay. I don't know. That's why I'm like, I don't know if that's accurate for this guy. Uh But, you Mm -hmm. know, I... Number one, I'm not a psychologist. Number two, I never met this guy. (laughs) Number three, what? I never met him as a child either. Okay. So, <laughs> yeah, I don't know, but it doesn't sound right to me. Oh, interesting. Well, I can't wait to talk about it more in our takes. Okay. So one of his classmates was a girl named Junko Ogata. Junko was born on February 25th, 1962 in Kirume Fukuoka Prefecture, and she also grew up in a wealthy family. Junko was strictly disciplined and expected to dress, speak and behave in a certain way. Futoshi and Junko were just acquaintances at the time. Futoshi's early life was plagued with disciplinary problems at school. He talked out of turn, argued with his teachers, and didn't always listen. Plus, there was his pathological lying. (laughs) (laughs) 
And he was eventually transferred to an all-male school when he was expelled for having a sexual relationship with a girl in junior high. After Junko graduated from high school, she worked in a preschool where she was described as caring and gentle. She and Matsunaga did not socialize after he was expelled from the school they both went to. So now let's get into the timeline. What do you got, Beth? At the age of 17, Matsunaga dropped out of school and took over the family's tatami business. He then converted it to a futon shop, renamed the company, dismissed all of the old employees and recruited young people to work for him. And I think he did that because he can control young people yeah. easier. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He set down a series of rules and regulations to punish employees who failed to perform well. Matsunaga married when he was 19 years old and the couple had a son. On the surface, it seemed as though Matsunaga was a regular man with a wife, child, and successful family business. He was seen as polite and known to be intelligent with a wide vocabulary. However, the people who were closest to him described him as jealous, sadistic, and angry. Hmm. He was narcissistic with delusions of grandeur and obsessed with religion, once stating to others that he was the Messiah. <laughs> okay. Oh, oh cool. wow. <laughs> oh, cool. yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what I would do if somebody said that to my face. So they'll be like, uh, uh, okay, bye. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, I just remembered I have something else to do other than stand in front of Listen you. Listen to your bullshit. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so he, and we mentioned he lied a lot and he lied to people all the time. And he liked it a lot. <laughs> Telling folks he was a graduate of Tokyo University, the most elite in the country. Or a novelist and lecturer from Kyoto University, another elite school. He was involved in various scams and crimes. If there was a crime or a scam to be had, he was in it to win it. <laughs> All right, baby, let's do this. Scam time. <laughs> Reportedly, Matsunaga used fraudulent practices to sell futons, pawning off cheap futons at exorbitant prices. He was also engaged in other forms of fraud and blackmail, eventually stealing over 180 million yen. Wow. Uh, you know, when I was researching this case, I thought it was so interesting that he went into the futon business. Like, yeah. I'm going to really strike it big with, with futons. futons. Yeah. Uh, you know, I I've never I lived in Japan. It, but... And so maybe, <laughs> maybe it's a big business. Were yeah. A huge business. But I mean, a futon is not. In Western eyes, yeah, futons are not. It wasn't an ideal not... piece of yeah. furniture. So that could just totally right. be a blind spot on my part, which I apologize for in advance. But I was like, what? Futons. And, you know, maybe futons in Japan are really nice, you know? May, I mean, uh, yeah. we're getting futons in the United States. They probably are not what, and I've, what they I've have in Japan. I've actually never bought a futon. They're always secondhand from, like, somebody who's trying to get rid of them. Yeah. So yeah. maybe I missed the futon craze. craze. Maybe yeah, I, I, did I buy, wasn't around. I did buy a futon once, and I, I did like it, but it wasn't real comfortable to sleep on. It was nice to have because it was a couch and then you could just make it into mm -hmm. a bed. But it wasn't real comfortable. Right. Yeah, we did that too in our first apartment long ago in yeah. Tempe, Arizona, where we had the bedroom in the living room. Yeah. <laughs> and we yeah. had a futon to make it all work. Yep. But all right. Sorry about that tangent. Matsunaga has also been described as quote unquote a charmer. And although he was married, he was also known to have a lot of mistresses. He liked to do marriage scams where he would convince women that he was going to marry them in order to get them to lend him money. Ooh, what's the opposite of a sugar daddy? That's what oh, that yeah. sounds like. A crap daddy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he was a crap daddy. <laughs> yeah, I got it. <laughs> From the late 1980s to the early 1990s, Matsunaga convinced a lot of women to borrow money from financial institutions for him, promising to pay them back. Guess what? Wait, he did he. and is an upstanding citizen to this day. <laughs> to this day. And okay. the episode is over. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> nope, he never did. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> According to a former employee of Matunaga, some of these women later completed suicide. Mm. And this is part of the losing face. Like, yeah, I think some of them couldn't even tell people what had happened to what them. What happened to them. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. it was so shameful to them. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I get it. His wife knew about his affairs, but she felt trapped. She was a victim of his physical and verbal abuse. And although she wanted to leave him, she felt that she couldn't. Mm. 
In 1982, Matsunaga reconnected with his high school classmate, Junko Ogata, and he invited her to work for him at his futon company. She and Matsunaga eventually started up a relationship. Ogata lived with her parents, didn't have much experience with men, and was a virgin until she began dating Matsunaga. After their third date, Ogata asked Matsunaga to drive her home to meet her 10 p.m. curfew. Matsunaga promised to take her home, but instead he took her to a hotel where he raped her. Afterwards, Matsunaga was apologetic. He told her that the reason why he'd done this was because he loved her so much. Oh, my God. Wow. And he told her that he would divorce his wife and marry her. Up until this point, she didn't even know that he was married. That's all kinds of wrong. Yeah. All kinds of wrong. Matsunaga then began showering her with gifts. This, you've talked about this before, yeah. Beth. Love bombing. Love bombing, yeah. Very dangerous. So Ogata believed that Matsunaga loved her, so she kept seeing him. As the relationship grew, Matsunaga became more and more strict with Ogata. He began to look through her diary and interrogated her about what she had written and any men's names written in it. He then began beating her. He also tattooed the word fat on Ogata's <gasps> right thigh with a safety pin and India ink. Oh. And he burned his name onto her right breast with a lit cigarette. Oh, my God. That sounds so painful. Painful. Yeah. And it, yeah, just, oh, torture. In order to isolate her, Matsunaga demanded that Ogata call her friends and read scripts to them that he had written. I feel so bad for her because she was so sheltered. Sheltered you know? and um, obedient. She was very mm -hmm. obedient to her family. Yeah. Yeah. So he made her say abusive things to them in order to destroy their relationship. This worked as intended and Ogata gradually lost all of her friends and was forced into a state of isolation and helplessness. In the summer of 1984, Junko Ogata couldn't stand the situation anymore. So she asked her sister Reiko for help. She told her, quote, I fell in love with a married man. I don't want to go on like this, but I don't know what to do, unquote. Later, Junko Ogata's parents learned about the affair, and Ogata faced strong opposition from her parents. In particular, Ogata's mother, Shizumi, did not approve of her daughter's relationship with Matsunaga. So Matsunaga decided to meet with her. The three of them, including Ogata, met for the first time at a restaurant. Matsunaga wore a suit and behaved like a gentleman. He made a good impression. He later met with her father as well, who was not impressed, but Matsunaga also signed a statement promising to marry Ogata, and Shizumi stopped opposing the match. Wow. Yeah. Matsunaga later claimed that Ogata's mother, Shizumi, seduced him, and they began a physical relationship. However, it's also been reported that he raped her, but they continued a sexual relationship. I think it's likely that if they did continue a physical relationship, it was through blackmail. Yeah, and we'll get into all his blackmail schemes in a little bit. Oh, yeah. my. Just endless. Yeah. A CVS receipt of blackmail. Yes. Three AM, the comedy horror podcast that holds weekly gatherings around the campfire. Let me tell you what you're gonna get. You're gonna hear stories about demonic possessions, prison stabbings, skinwalkers, glitches in the Matrix, cult leaders, missing four one one, night marchers, Operation Paperclip, Mesopotamian devil worship, and so many monsters it'll give Kanye West a runaway for his money. Pop and meme culture also aren't off topic. A camp where laughs and scares are constantly competing for first place. We're just a group of friends trying to bust each other's balls, find the best stories, and expand the circle in the process. 3 a.m., the comedy horror podcast, not for the faint or fragile of heart. Let's go. The crime was so brutal it was compared to the Manson murders. Mary and Bill, an Ohio cold case, explores what it takes to bring new attention to an unsolved double homicide and turns up new hope for answers. Listen to Mary and Bill, an Ohio cold case from IdeaStream Public Media, wherever you get your podcasts. Ogata attempted suicide in February of 1985. Matsunaga then convinced Ogata that her family hated her because of this. Mm. So Ogata left her parents' home in Kurumi, Fukuoka Prefecture to live with Matsunaga and his wife. She and Matsunaga eventually had two children. That happened fast. Yeah. 
So Matsunaga continued with his campaign of violence, and he would often assault both his wife and Ogata at the same time. His wife would get angry and fight back, but Ogata took the beatings in silence. In an incident to demonstrate this kind of thing, Matsunaga's ex-wife recalled that when Matsunaga was assaulting Ogata, he told her to lick mayonnaise off of the floor. His wife told him to stop because their child was in the room watching. But Ogata went ahead and bent down and licked the mayonnaise off the floor just as she'd been told. Shout out to the wife for yeah. recognizing like there's children there's, here yeah. who are Hello. observing these problematic behaviors. Yeah. Incidents of violence increased until Matsunaga's wife couldn't take it anymore and ran away with their child, taking refuge in a shelter for victims of domestic violence. She filed for divorce papers, and the couple divorced in March of 1992. Back at Matsunaga's futon company, he was abusing his employees as well. He held some of the men captive in the building, using blackmail to keep them there, and used the third floor to abuse them and electrically shock his employees. The electrical shock thing is so extreme and odd for a human a human being to think this is a great idea to do to somebody else yeah and he loved it he loved yeah. to shock people he used it too much yeah too much did we mention this is a tough case yeah anyway i think once is too much <laughs> i mean just the words freak me freak out you out yeah so between 1985 and 1992 Futoshi engaged in extortion and fraud, earning about 180 million yen. That's 2.2 million U.S. dollars in the 90s. Yeah, that's a lot. Jesus. Uh, That's a ton. He's really good at this shitty behavior. He's really good at it. That's what's frustrating is he's too good at it. And, you know, it's just so it's just unfortunate all around. Yeah. And he's not dead yet. Did I mention that yeah. in the stats? No, he's but still, yeah, still kicking. He's still it. kicking. Yeah. So in 1992, Matsunaga's company went bankrupt. He had done some kind of scheme to turn the company over to a woman he was quote unquote dating, and he left her holding the bag. Reportedly, he and Ogata were put on Japan's national most wanted list, but they managed to escape from justice. Ogata gave birth to her first son in January of 1993. That same year, Futoshi seduced a woman and, after telling her that Junko was his sister, managed to convince her to leave her husband and bring her three children to live with him. After the suspicious death of her two-year-old daughter in September of 1993, the other two children were sent to live with their father. And from my research, nobody knew what happened, nobody knows. how that daughter yeah. died. No, okay. I don't know. Okay. So during their relationship, Matsunaga defrauded the woman for 11.8 million yen. That's approximately $145,000 U.S. In March of 1994, she allegedly completed suicide by throwing herself into the sea. This part is a bit confusing because reportedly police were unable to prove that Matsunaga had killed the woman or her child. But he was also reported to be on Japan's most wanted list. So we don't know if he was going under a pseudonym at that time or what. And yeah. that might be why he escaped prosecution. Yeah, I tried to find more information about that, but I couldn't. Okay. In October of 1994, Matsunaga and Ogata moved into a condominium in Kitakyushu with a man named Kumio Toraya, a real estate agent, and his daughter, who is never named anywhere and is only known as Kumio's daughter. It's not clear to me whose condo this was. It might have been Kumio's, but Matsunaga did have a habit of using the women that he defrauded to rent or buy places for him to live under their names. The audacity of this guy. Like he, I have a feeling it has a lot to do with that quote unquote disorder that we mentioned earlier. And I only say quote unquote only because we don't know if he really had it. And not to say that it's yeah. a disorder. The only reason why I said that it doesn't sound right to me is that People who have that disorder, they don't commit crimes like this. They're just like they don't have the or hurt other people or hurt other people. Yeah. Yeah. I think he has a personality disorder of some kind, probably antisocial personality disorder, Mm -hmm. you know, and children aren't really diagnosed with things because Mm -hmm. they change as they get older. Like you can't diagnose a child with antisocial Mm -hmm. personality disorder. Because oh really no you can't Why? because Why? they don't they're changing all the time I oh, mean right, right. if 
you could diagnose a two-year-old with antisocial personality disorder because they're so selfish and they don't give a shit. You know, they'll throw a toy mm-hmm. at your head. Right. But they don't have antisocial personality <laughs> disorder. They're two. <laughs> right. You know, right. right. And Very they're good point. growing and kids with that other disorder, they just they don't have like the kind of social inhibitions that we have or like you're mm-hmm. scared of strangers Mm -hmm. they just don't Mm -hmm. have that so they're just like friendly to everybody but it's friendly it's not like i don't know it just doesn't sound right nefarious or malicious exactly um evil Uh, this this is just an evil he just is evil Evil. yeah Uh, and and do uh, you hate this guy as uh, much as i do (laughs) yes i loathe this guy i loathe him (laughs) but i just wanted to add that children are sometimes diagnosed and the person diagnosing them is wrong. Yeah. Ask anybody yeah. who's got a child who has behavior issues, how many diagnoses they've got. Oh yeah. If they, Til if they they've get taken to the, them to, the to the right doctors one. and psychologists mm-hmm. and psychiatrists, how many mm-hmm. disorders have they been diagnosed with? Yeah, because yeah. they just don't know. And kids grow and change. And yeah, that's all I got. Well, I'm really glad you said all of that, Beth. And thank you for helping me understand. And hopefully the listeners will understand where you're coming from, too. I appreciate it. Sure. Rant over. (laughs) (laughs) So in any case, Kumio made the mistake of trusting Matsunaga and telling him that he had a criminal past. Matsunaga then jumped on this information and used it to blackmail and control Kumio. He also forced Kumio to write a statement that he'd sexually molested his daughter, which was not true. But this was also used to control Kumio. Eventually, Kumio and his daughter were being held as captives in the condo. Matsunaga tortured them. This included starvation, electrical shocks, Kumio being forced to eat his own feces, Mm. as well as making them hurt each other to avoid being electrically shocked. The two were made to sleep in the bathroom on the floor, which was covered with newspaper. The eating the feces thing is, I don't think we've seen that before. At least I don't recall. Yeah. Explicitly spelled out as a way to hurt people. Yeah. In any of the cases that we've covered so far. So this was shocking. Extra. And still is. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Are we still doing this episode? Okay. Here it goes. Hurry up. Let's get over. Let's get it over. (laughs) Oh, God. (laughs) Wow. Okay. So um, can I read without my eyes open? Nope. I can't. Ogata never stopped Matsunaga and sometimes actually participated in torturing Kumio and his daughter. On the other hand, Matsunaga also physically abused Ogata, kicking, punching, and electrically shocking her when she behaved in a way that he didn't like. So was she really participating in the torture of the victims willingly? No, I do not think so. I never have. And I feel really bad for her throughout this entire thing, even to this day. I know she... We'll get into it, but yeah, we I just feel bad for her. Yeah. In any case, by January 1996, Kumio had lost so much weight that he'd become very ill. Due to malnutrition, his extremities were swollen and his body was scabbed all over. Matsunaga once ordered Kumio to eat the scabs that had fallen from his body to the floor. In February 1996, after two years of imprisonment, the 34-year-old father died. Matsunaga confirmed his death by using electrocution to see if he would respond. Ugh, what a dick. Yeah. And I don't know if we've mentioned this yet, but he, obviously we get that he was controlling, but he would limit their food intake, their yeah. water intake. Everything. Uh, he, con- he controlled ev- everything. He controlled yeah, every aspect of their lives. Right. But he then convinced Kumio's daughter that it was her fault, telling her that he died because she hit him on the head when she was cleaning. And because he had forced her to bite her father, He then threatened to use the bite marks as proof that she killed him. So, you know, another way to control all the manipulation. You're you're doing the bad thing, too. So better not say anything. Awful. He had her write up a statement of facts saying that she was the one who killed her father. Afterwards, Matsunaga made a habit of constantly telling her that even if she talked, the police wouldn't believe her. Mm -hmm. since she signed the statement of facts and she would be the one who was arrested. She was 11 years old. Oh, my God. Yeah. I was going to say, she's 11. So there's yeah. like, n- unless, I don't know, there's, it just seems like there's there was would be no hope for her. No, to- there's nothing she could do. Yeah. Yeah. This is hard. So convincing both Ogata and Kumio's daughter 
that the only way to avoid arrest was to dismember and get rid of the corpse. He forced them to do it, with Matsunaga directing the show and giving them detailed instructions on how it should be done. So he forced Kumio's daughter to dismember her father. Her father's body. Yeah. 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 And then told her it was her fault. Yeah. And I I just feel bad for everyone who's come in contact with Matsunaga. Yeah. He's a black hole. Yeah, he is. God damn it. <laughs> I hate this guy. So much. <laughs> oh, man. So the work was temporarily suspended when Ogata, who was pregnant with her second child, went into labor prematurely. So she's pregnant. She's dismembering a corpse. And she went into labor prematurely. Great. Yeah. She had to go to the maternity hospital to give birth. But after she came home, the pieces of Kumio's body were boiled down and flushed down the toilet and the bones thrown into the sea. So soon after, Matsunaga found another victim. He convinced a woman that he was a graduate of Kyoto University and he promised to marry her. Instead, he defrauded her of 5.6 million yen, about $69,000. And she and her daughter were confined to Matsunaga's apartment. In March of 1997, the woman escaped by jumping from the second floor. She was put into the care of a mental hospital, and her daughter was released. In April of 1997, Ogata tried to escape. She went to work and did not return, seeking refuge at her parents' house. Matsunaga began calling her parents constantly. When this didn't work to get Ogata to come back, a few months later, he faked his own suicide. Mm -hmm. Yep. Oh, jeez. Believing that he was dead, Ogata returned to the house and found him alive. He then began treating her even more harshly. Now, one source I consulted said that her family went along with it to get her to go back. To oh, him. really? Yeah. Huh. I don't know if that's I didn't right. read that, but it's possible okay. because we'll yeah. get into it. I mean, that's how manipulative he was. He, was. I mean, he yeah. had the strings on everybody. Yeah. So as punishment for trying to leave him, Matsunaga raped her sister, Reiko, and then blamed Ogata for it because she tried to escape. And it so was all everything's her all her fault. Yeah. Yep. He told Ogata's parents that Ogata was a murderer and he began to blackmail and threaten them. In an attempt to get rid of Matsunaga, the family gave him 63 million yen, about 777,000 U.S. dollars. It's so big. It's a number I'll never come <laughs> close to, but it is so foreign to me. I can't even say can't it. Can't say it. A lot of money. <laughs> uh, almost three quarters of a billion dollars. After which he lured them to his home and he imprisoned them in his home. Yeah. Which is so crazy. That was one of the craziest parts. Yeah. And I'm not sure how this happened, but now that you mentioned that maybe they were in on the pretending that he had that he went along with yeah the going right? along with it maybe the blackmail started earlier uh -huh. i don't know i don't know yeah so yeah because i was real puzzled about how this all happened yeah he's working everybody yeah which i also thought god this sounds exhausting yeah it's a lot of work i can't even be a puppet master of my own life <laughs> Let alone, Let alone a whole, a whole another family. family. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so six members of Ogata's family, her parents, Takashigi and Shizumi, her sister Reiko, and her brother-in-law, Kazuya, and their two children, Eya and Yuki, were forced to live with the couple in the Kitayushu condo. Yeah, and I imagine this condo is small, but there's yeah, a lot of people big. living in it and yeah. a, a lot of horrific things happening. But I know that he's also wealthy. So maybe it was a bigger condo than normal. Than usual. You know, like, yeah. yeah. I pictured it as being like one of those big condos in Manhattan that wealthy people live in. But I actually don't know. That was, my, was what I imagined. In one of the Japanese sources, they had a picture, like a diagram of the condo. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it was a picture and everything was in Japanese. And mm -hmm. Google Translate didn't translate the stuff in the picture. Oh, and so it was just a diagram, but I don't know what was what, but it didn't look okay. very big. Oh, OK. OK. Well, there goes my dreams again <laughs> with this story. So Matsunaga convinced them that disobedience would be a reason for punishing not only the offender, but the entire family. And that if any one of them tried to escape, the rest of the family would be killed immediately. While imprisoned, the Ogata family were constantly tortured and abused. 
That's an understatement. Yeah. I mean, yeah. We are keeping a lot of it out for your mental health as yes. well as ours. Yes. <laughs> All six of them were murdered between December 1997 and June 1998. Ogata's father, Takashige, 61, was electrocuted on December 21, 1997, when Matsunaga coerced Ogata to kill her father through electrical shock. Ogata's mother, Shizumi, in a constant state of physical stress, grew weak and began to lose her mind. On January 20, 1998, Futoshi ordered Reiko and Reiko's husband, Katsuya, to strangle her to death, which they did. As a result of the abuse, Reiko lost her hearing, and on February 10th, 1998, Matsunaga ordered Katsuya to strangle Reiko to death, with their 10-year-old daughter Eya holding her down. Katsuya was then locked in a bathroom, where he starved to death on April 13th, 1998. On May 17, 1998, Futoshi ordered the remaining women to kill Ogata's five-year-old nephew, Yuki. Aya strangled Yuki, while Ogata and Kumio's daughter held him down. Aya was then killed on June 7, 1998. During the trial, Kumio's daughter testified that Ogata and Matsunaga tortured Aya to death with electricity. However, Ogata denied this and claimed that Kumio's daughter said this because she felt guilty. And it was Kumio's daughter, by order of Matsunaga, who had killed Aya by strangulation. So it's like even Junko is like, her her reality is warped, right? Yeah. I mean, I feel like everybody who's in Matsunaga's orbit deserves grace. Yeah. Because they were all controlled and manipulated in by such him. horrific yeah. ways. Yeah. Yeah. And I totally also get that not everybody will agree with me. Anyway. Matsunaga and Ogata cut the bodies up and boiled them, then flushed them down the toilet and threw them into the sea. After the murders, the house was completely renovated. Ogata and her two children were the last survivors of the Ogata family. Matsunaga continued to defraud and scam women. In July of 2000, Matsunaga seduced yet another woman by promising to marry her. Oh! Yeah. <laughs> Continuing it on. That's <laughs> you how it gets his have to be lonely <laughs> at Matsunaga.com. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, I shouldn't have did that. I should have did that. It was funny. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> so um, this is how he gets his money, you know? This yeah. is his job. <laughs> yeah. Oh my god. Sorry. I was gonna um, do it again, but no. <laughs> your laughter is is plenty satisfying. <laughs> in August 2001, she gave birth to twins and gave them to Matsunaga and Ogata. Matsunaga then demanded 20 million yen, about $247,000 from her, claiming that this money would go to raising the babies. Kumio's daughter was held captive until 2002 when she managed to escape. This was her second escape attempt, the first one having ended with Matsunaga finding and torturing her even more than usual. And I was going to say, all the sources I consulted referred to her as child A. Yeah. So I couldn't decipher who she was. So just for other people listening who may have heard of this case, I just wanted to bring that to the pod. So, okay. You know. Okay. Yeah. Hear Her Sports is a podcast for everyone who loves stories by and about women striving to improve and make a difference in their lives. I am your host, Elizabeth Emery, a former professional cyclist. In every episode, I introduce a female athlete or woman in the business of sport through a thoughtful conversation about who they are and the terrific work they're doing. My guests and I explore the glorious and frustrating issues in sports, history, equity, training, nutrition, and so much more. Join us for inspiration, for community, and for love of being a strong athletic woman. Now it's time to get into the investigation and the arrest. Finally! <laughs> <laughs> So on March 6, 2002, a thinly dressed girl with bare feet staggered to the door of a Kitakushu police station. She told police that she was 17 years old and had been imprisoned for eight years. She also told them that her father had been murdered 
and she pleaded with them to go to the house where she had been held captive. The police arrested Matsunaga and Junko the next day, and the twins and the couple's two children were taken into police protection. When searching the condo, police found that most of the windows in the home were covered with blackout curtains, and multiple padlocks had been installed on the interior doors and windows. Also, a large number of air fresheners. Of course! Empty plastic bottles and detergents were found. Shukan Gendai, a journalist who followed the investigation from the beginning, said that in the house, police found an incredible number of homemade pornographic pictures and videos of the victims, which were taken by Matsunaga. Initially, the media reported that the couple simply kept people illegally in the house. But as the investigation progressed, the horrifying details came out. Most newspapers and television programs refused to tell in detail about the crimes committed. But several authors published books that conveyed the evidence heard during the investigation and at the trial. Speaking of the trial, let's get into it. Okay. Hey, <laughs> <laughs> the pair was charged with the murders of Kumio, Shizumi, Reiko, Kazuya, Aya, and Yuki, and the manslaughter of Takashigi. There was no trace of the crimes that they committed, and none of the bodies has ever been recovered. So the criminal case rested solely on the testimony of Kumio's daughter and Ogata, who admitted to the murders. Throughout the trial, Matsunaga denied having committed murder, claiming only he abused the victims because he did not like their attitude. Okay, they had attitude problems. <laughs> and he did not intend to kill them because they were his quote-unquote money trees. He insisted that Ogata had committed the murders on her own. Yeah, nothing's his fault. He I'm didn't sorry. do anything. Uh, is, there anybody, <laughs> is there anybody around here that Who is believes just... that? <laughs> yes. Jesus. Oh, my God. But Ogata claimed that Matsunaga abused and manipulated her into a physical and mental state in which she had no choice but to obey his orders. During the trial, Ogata, who had always thought that her mother had seduced Matsunaga into a sexual relationship, began to suspect that never happened and that Matsunaga had actually raped her mother. Yeah, this manipulation is so deep. Yeah. That she, I mean, he pitted these two women against, against each, each other. other. Yeah. And, you know, we talked minimally about the torture, but the details are horrific. And family members were being manipulated into harming other family members. And this was one of the ways that he did it. Yeah. By convincing divide and conquer. women. Yeah, divide and conquer. So the prosecutor said that the case was without comparison in the criminal history of Japan. The judge described Matsunaga as cruel, twisted, and inhumane. Thank you, judge. Uh, the court said that the couple conspired. Now, the couple, I don't know if I agree with that, conspired to kill six of their victims. And Matsunaga was the mastermind and Ogata his willful executioner. They were both found guilty and sentenced to death in 2005. Matsunaga immediately appealed the sentence to a high court. Immediately. Immediately. Well, now let's get into it. Let's see if he had any luck. Let's get into <laughs> where are they now? Mm -hmm. Tell us, Beth. After Matsunaga was caught, his ex-wife told reporters, quote, If I hadn't escaped him, my family would have been murdered like Junko's was. I feel so sorry for Junko, unquote. I'm glad somebody said it to the press at the time. Yeah. Because she admitted her guilt and testified at trial, Ogata appealed for a life sentence, which the Fukuoka District Court granted on September 26, 2007, focusing on the master-subordinate relationship between Matsunaga and Ogata. The court upheld the ruling that sentenced Ogata to life imprisonment. Matsunaga was not so lucky. His appeal was denied. Too bad. Oh, no. Wait, you can't manipulate the state? What? Oh, no. I want to do over. <laughs> I don't believe in the death penalty, but I also don't care if they burn this guy at the stake. So, girl, yeah. girl, I'm right there with you. If I could do an internet high five to you right now, I would. Because I couldn't agree more with you. This yeah. is what you just said. Yeah. So fuck now let's, let's get into our takes, friend. Yes, fuck this guy to start. <laughs> and what do you got in addition to? <laughs> so as we mentioned earlier, Matsunuga was straight up evil. Yeah, yeah. He was a sadistic psychopath who used people like toilet paper. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Wow. Oh my yeah. God, you should write a <laughs> book. <laughs> So in some ways, he reminds me of the Tinder swindler or that guy in Bad Vegan. 
I haven't seen Bad Vegan yet. You haven't? Oh, okay. Mm -mm. Do they just use women for money? Yeah. And they do these marriage scams? Yeah. Yeah. You know what he reminds me of? Remember the the father, the black father in Fresno who had all of his family with him? Right. And and everyone in the family died for his gain. Right. Yeah. So Matsunaga just loved scamming, in particular, scamming women. It's so weird to say. <laughs> yeah. He just loved Love, scamming. Loved I think I'm going to yeah. scam today. Woo! <laughs> what? He also reminded me of H.H. H. Holmes, who scammed and oh. murdered women back in the 19th century. I don't know if you know that case. I do. Only because of you, Fred. Oh, okay. When we first started our true crime relationship. <laughs> I told you about you told him. Me about him, and I was like, oh, "I have yeah. never." I mean, oh my god! I he made it. It it's still. I'm. It's wild. It's baffling. Yeah. I don't know what to say. It's a wild story. H.H. Holmes <laughs> is insane. It's an insane. Yeah. <laughs> and so is this one. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, you're right. <laughs> but this guy was the worst. Wait, the you worst. Think, Capitalized. You the if worst. There was a podium of first place, second place, and third place. He uh, he would Matsunaga win. Matsunaga would be first and AJ's home yeah, would be as the second? worst. Yeah. For sure. <laughs> oh, wow. <Yeah. laughs> he just loved he loved scamming and he loved torturing people. Yeah. He didn't care if they were men, women, or children. Anybody. And he didn't give a crap about what happened to them. Mm-hmm. It's hard to understand how he was able to manipulate the victims to the point where they were torturing and killing each other. Yeah. But I think the concept of saving face probably played into it. Absolutely. He used blackmail to control people. And I think one of the reasons this worked so well was because they consciously or unconsciously needed to save face. Right. And Ogata was probably also trying to protect his face. Matsunaga's face. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It's terrible that Ogata participated in these crimes, but I think she was beaten down to the point where she just couldn't disobey Matsunaga. Right. And there was a case in the 80s where a lawyer, Joel Steinberg, have you heard of him? No. So he was convicted of the murder of his daughter, Lisa, and it was like a huge story back in the day. And it was really sad. Yeah. He and his wife had a noose bomb. They had two children and the children were neglected and abused, kept in cages and shit like that. Oh, my God. And when the story first broke, at first, people also blamed Hedda. The mother. Yeah, because she's the mother and they expected her to protect the children. Mm -hmm. But it turned out that she was a victim of some horrific domestic abuse Uh to the point where she was disfigured. Because she'd been punched in the face so often. Oh, my God. Wow. And I think Ogata's case is similar to that. Yeah. 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 Yes. And this, as we mentioned a thousand times, this one was (laughs) really difficult to research. Yeah. The details were so horrific. I didn't want to describe them all. I just kind of touched on them. So if you want to know more, you can look at our links. Yep. Yep. Yeah, but uh, and we also ended up recording this one three days late because it was so difficult to research. <laughs> yeah, it, difficult. Yes, difficult, I think, is is a good word to describe putting this together and learning about this case and these victims and the history. And I thought it was going to be fun. The We're culture. going to Japan. Yeah, but no. I know. You always say the Twitter killer, which I think also took place in Japan. The Twitter killer. Yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah, I, I just... knew you were enthused about this friend. Yeah. Because of all your statements, every interview we do. What's your favorite episode? Beth, here she comes. The Twitter here she comes, killer. The Twitter just, killer. Yeah, Maybe and, I'll and change so it like, later. You know I don't know. Beth is going to be all over this, but this was a challenge not for fun. all of us. Yeah. Yeah. And I would say that this is one of, if not the most horrifying case we've ever covered. Yeah. It went on for so long and the harm done to these people was so profound. I don't know exactly what came of the survivors because all the research I did didn't identify the names. No, didn't mention uh, what happened to them. What happened to them. Like Kumio's daughter and and the children and Mm -hmm. anything like that. Yeah. Yeah. Because there were some survivors and I just hope that wherever they are, they're healing. And living good lives. Yeah. It was interested to me why he needed or wanted to hurt so many people. And yeah. I know that there were the claims that he had this disinhibited social engagement disorder, which is a DSM thing. I mean, it's real. It's in books. It, people yeah, get dis- it is real. diagnosed with this, but I don't know what to make of it. And it's just it's a mystery to me. And I suppose, you know, he was able to go on for so long because he also had the financial means 
to continue to manipulate people and survive, right? Like he wasn't destitute. They had a, a there was always a home to live. There was always electricity on because he was electrocuting everybody. Yeah. And it was yeah. just like the electrocution, the blackmail, the amount of horrific things wrapped into one case was astounding to me. I also don't think that Junko should be implicated. I think everybody who was in this guy's orbit was just like a fly on a on a sticky trap. Everybody got yeah. stuck and hurt. And yeah. I just this was a tough case and I just feel for the victims and the whole community. Yeah. It's just a really sad, horrifying case. <gasps> yeah. I'm glad it's over. I'm glad it's over. All right. Now let's get into how not to get <laughs> murdered. So mm-hmm. if you love true crime and you don't want to die, here's a tip for you. <laughs> this <sighs> segment is not intended to be victim blaming. We thought of this segment because I read somewhere that a lot of people listen to true crime because they want to know what they can do to be safer. This is not meant to blame the victims. It's just learning from other people's experiences. So just wanted to shout out people who might be experiencing the things that we discussed in this case or who might know somebody who is experiencing something like this. So you can call the National Domestic Violence Hotline for support and resources and advice on your safety at 1-800-799-SAFE. These will also all be in the description box. I also wanted to shout out domesticshelters.org, and they have national and international resources for people because we got <laughs> Fruit Loops is worldwide, but they have resources for everybody, not just people in the United States. I also wanted to shout out to the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline 988. Call or text it. It's free. It's available 24-7. You can also text home to 741741. I've said this before. This 741741 is something I've used personally, and I'm still here to talk about it. So it's a crisis counselor hotline, and uh, it's global, and it's not for profit, and 24-7 and confidential. So now it's shout out time. Yay! What what do you know? (laughs) When we shout out any content by or about people of color or any other minoritized folks or any true crime goodies. Just a reminder, we're doing our video club and what we're going to watch, thanks Marlene, is The Stroll, I believe. And the things I wanted to shout out are No One Should Believe Me, in particular the latest episode, which aired today, called Only the Beginning, about... Now, is this a podcast or... Yeah, No One Should Believe Me is a podcast about people who survived abuse, domestic abuse, abuse of any kind. And it's their stories. It's very well researched. And every episode is a little bit different. Okay. So this latest episode is called Only the Beginning, and it's about what happens after someone survives abuse. In this case, it was about Munchausen by proxy and the after effects and all the support that's required after somebody gets convicted of doing this stuff. What happens to the people left behind, the people who were harmed, Mm. and all the systems that swoop in to try to help the person? And then I also wanted to shout out Investigative True Crime Podcast. It is called The Retrievals. Have you heard it? No. The Retrievals. No. It's brought to you by Serial and the New York Times about women seeking fertility treatment at Yale. Whoa. You know, that Ivy League school on the East Coast. And what they discovered is that all of these women were experiencing extreme pain during their egg retrieval. Oh. Any procedure in between your legs hurts and you need something, some sort yeah. of medication to, to deal with it. But it turns out that a nurse who was helping with these procedures was stealing the fentanyl. Oh, my God. Was intended. Wow. So these women were under excruciating pain, but sucking it up because they wanted a baby. Oh, right. Wow. And I've been through six years of fertility treatments. It fucking sucks. Yeah. Anyway, this nurse was stealing the fentanyl and replacing it with saline, which is just salt water solution. And it's about that entire case and how it unraveled. Wonderful stuff. And then Crime Scene Kitchen, I talked about it briefly on our Extra Extra, but it's just a fun show. If you love true crime, but you're like, I could deal without the murder, just give me (laughs) cupcakes. And it's about, it's a TV series. It's on Fox, but I think you can find it on Hulu, hosted by Joel McHale. 
and it's a cooking show and these people go into a crime scene and figure out what was made and then they make it and then they make a piece. That sounds that's so it. fun. <laughs> yeah. What do you got? So I wanted to shout out They Clone Tyrone on Netflix. Have you seen it yet? Oh, girl, have I seen it yet? Yes. And I am convinced it's already happening. Yeah, I knew it. So. I knew you would love it because it features lots of conspiracy yep. theories. Lots of conspiracies. And I was like, they're putting it in the creamy crack. They're putting it in the chicken. They're putting it in the meat. They're putting it in everything. everything yeah. Of <gasps> yes. So, so it's good. described as a sci-fi comedy and it's written by Jewel Taylor, who I, I didn't know who that was, but I Googled him and he's uh-huh. a black guy. And okay. it stars Jamie Foxx and yep, some other people yep. who I didn't know, but they're they're great. Yeah. And it's kind of a satire on black exploitation movies. Yep. And one person who reviewed the movie said it felt like a 70s period piece happening now. <laughs> yeah. At first I was like, what, what? time period yeah. is this taking? Because Jamie Foxx is he is like a 70s, 80s pimp. Yeah. But it's but it's and they like, drive around in old time. cars. But they yeah, have cell phones yeah. and, you yeah. know, it's, it's, it's yeah. really interesting. Um, uh, yeah. yeah. So I loved it. Yeah. I thought it, it was, was great. I loved it too. I watched it with my mom this oh, weekend. How fun. It, was, it was fun. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so just to recap, that's No One Should Believe Me, a podcast, and particularly the latest episode, Only the Beginning, which aired today, August 3rd, The Retrievals, also a podcast, wherever you get your podcast, Crime Scene Kitchen, a true crime baking show on Hulu <laughs> and they cloned Tyrone on Netflix. Oh, oh my God. That's the end. That's the end. Yay. Oh my God. Yes. Well, we did it. This is the one time I might, I'm going to get off my medicine ball and do a cartwheel. <laughs> um, <laughs> all right. Well, um, that's it. So, in the meantime, Beth, where can the people find us? Our website is fruitloopspod.com and we use Fruit Loops Pod for all of our social media. The footnotes for each episode can be found on our website. Plus, check it out for the different ways that you can support the show and become a Fruit Loops patron. You can also support us by supporting our sponsors or by giving us a five star review. Five, five stars, stars only, only, please. please. <laughs> <laughs> also, don't forget to subscribe, which helps a lot. It does. Yeah. Well, this is a weekly podcast and new episodes drop every Thursday. So until next time, look alive, y'all. It's crazy out there. is waiting for a live show please ladies please 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 okay bye if i could do an internet high five to you right now i would because <laughs> i couldn't agree more with you can you hear my walls vibrating nope it's okay is it my, windy uh, old whitey is listening to some oh. hip-hop so <laughs> loud that the ground is shaking oh i just read that one. Oh, <laughs> sorry friend <laughs> oh it's my turn <laughs> oh I'm like, what's going maybe on? she's looking at she's, the letters and I'm, mesmerizing <laughs> her. That's my friend over there. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I lost my place. Sorry. I lost my place. He also said he was involved in, uh, or no, he didn't say this. Sorry. Karumi Fukuoka Prefect, Fuki, Fuku, Fukuoka Prefecture. Or Shogunate. Who I think it's Shogunate. Shogun. Okay. Uh, I'm starting all of that. Fukuoka. Fukuyo, Fukuoka. Oh my God! I, I he made it. It it's still. I'm. It's wild. It's baffling. I don't know what to say. But nailed it.
<laughs> expeditiously. Whoa, and, Brent, are you okay? <laughs> was I going too fast? No, no. It just it felt like you gave up. Oh. <laughs> like you saw the title of the episode and you were like, 16. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Uh, do you hate this guy as uh, much yes. as I do? <laughs> yes, I loathe this guy. I loathe him. <laughs> Are we still doing this episode? Okay, here it goes. Can I read without my eyes open? Nope, I can't. God damn it. I hate this guy. So much. Oh, man. He was a crap daddy. Yeah, I got it. You don't have to be lonely at matsunaga.com. Came, came to me and I'm, I'm just glad I was able to insert that for some sort of levity into this episode. And the episode is over. Goodbye. <laughs> All right. Nighty night. Nighty have night. a good weekend. You too. Bye. Listen to Mr. Bunker's Conspiracy Time podcast. It's a fun show about weird stuff. New episodes every Wednesday, ya eggheads. I'm Art. And I'm Andy. And Mr. Bunker's Conspiracy Time is a podcast about conspiracies, the paranormal, UFOs, unsolved mysteries. We're, we're going to be discussing the Kennedy assassinations. Oh, yeah. That's his nickname, Finger Banging Bob Lazar. Give me some aliens with some good frickin' spacecraft. The whole enchilada. <laughs> the only thing bigger than Bigfoot's feet are our egos. If you like simulation theory, ancient history, egghead science, and Mandela effect, that kind of stuff. So check it out. New episodes every Wednesday. All the links you need on MrBunkersConspiracyTime.com. And we'll see you in the bunker. Greetings from Evergreen Podcasts. We're rolling out a listener survey, and we want to hear from you. The information in the survey will help us gather statistics and in turn make our shows more appealing to advertisers. I know most people don't like ads, but this is one of the only ways our shows make money and help keep their lights on. We promise it will only take a few minutes, but the impact on our podcasts will be tremendous. As a token of our appreciation, we'll randomly select one lucky participant each month to win an exclusive merchandise package from Evergreen Podcasts. Head to evergreenpodcast.com slash listener survey to help a show and possibly get some free stuff for doing so. We can't thank you enough for the support. Now back to the show.